All right, so um, Wuthering Heights this afternoon. Now you've had a look at the video, I hope, on uh, Gothic fiction. And remember, we're looking for the manifestation of such things. So let's reconsider these opening few passages now that you've started to, one would hope, read the novel. I've talked at length about the fact that the outsider Lockwood arrives here um, into Wuthering Heights and that immediately sets this book up to to really live within that classic idea of what gothic romantic uh, literature is like. Now when we consider this first paragraph we've already talked about the the reliability of Lockwood as a, as a narrator. Um, he's full of these wonderful sort of affirmations a beautiful country and there's an exclamation mark there as you know uh, and then a capital fellow he has this this sort of um, idea that he's moved into some kind of fantastic place it's it's an interesting thing however when we do meet Heathcliff and we meet him on the very first page and that's actually pretty cool when we do meet him uh, Lockwood greets him with what one might consider to be a traditional kind of greeting. Mr Lockwood, your new tenant, sir, I do myself the honour of calling as soon as possible after my arrival to express hope that I have not inconvenienced you by my perseverance in soliciting the occupation of Thrust Cross Grange. I heard yesterday you had some thoughts, and then we have a little dash there, and that dash represents someone being interrupted. In drama, we would um, actually talk over the top of someone when we saw that dash. We would start our sentence a few beats in. Now, that is exceptionally rude to do that, considering that Lockwood is speaking with all correct procedure. And his language, as you can see, is very businesslike, is very formalised. And that is the epitome, of course, of the London gentleman, of the modern London gentleman. And so he comes in here and the expectation is we're going to get a, a story about manners, you know, that the correct way to be and the correct way to do things and, and, and a costume drama and all that kind of stuff we come to expect. But we get this interruption, Heathcliff interrupted, wincing. I should not allow anyone to inconvenience me if I could hinder it, walk in. His response is abrupt brutal and pointed. And so that shows straight away that Lockwood has stepped into a world of which he is not familiar, a world of which the behaviours, the rules of the game are alien and different. The walk-in was uttered with closed teeth and expressed the sentiment, go to the deuce. Even the gate over which he leant manifested no sympathising movement to the words, and I think that circumstance determined me to accept the invitation. I felt interested in a man who seemed more exaggeratedly reserved than myself. So uh, there's an unease straight away in this world. And it really is um, a very significant setup, this meeting, in that sense. So this whole first chapter continues on in this sort of way and this establishment. Uh, here we meet the Joseph character that we, you know, is going to annoy us later on with his language. Uh, but we get the definition of Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights is the name of Mr Heathcliff's dwelling. Wuthering being a significant provincial adjective. And what that means is um, this is language that is not used in modern English. Provincial means it's it's an adjective used in that, that Yorkshire area specifically. So we're, we're moving from the city to the provincial town, to the small town, and provincial language is used. English is really a second language to these people. These people speak in dialect. Um, it's descriptive of the atmospheric tumult to which its station is exposed in stormy weather. So immediately we have the pathetic fallacy played on that the actual house is representative of the stormy nature of these people and the stormy relationships that's going to happen. It's the classic moving to a haunted house scenario, even though this isn't really a haunted house. It kind of is, but it isn't. Pure bracing ventilation they must have up here at all times. Indeed, one may guess the power of the north wind blowing over the edge by the excessive slant of a few stunted firs at the end of the house and by a range of gaunt thorns all stretching their limbs one way as if craving arms of the sun. The happy architect had foresight to build it strong. The narrow windows are deeply set in the wall and the corners defended with large jutting stones. Now that... Um, is, is a perfect description of a Gothic mansion. Here we get some kind of intrigue. The date above 
is Hareton Earnshaw, not Heathcliff. So immediately we understand that Heathcliff is possibly a usurper, someone who should not be um, a tenant or be the owner of this particular place. This doesn't actually bear out very well for him at this point. Then we meet the family in the sitting room and it's quite a wild meeting and they do, do not behave in the way he would expect. And we suddenly get a change in language. We get things like villainous old guns here, horse pistols and all this sort of um, stuff of to be concerned about, of, of concern. Um, and that, so that first chapter is what really, really sets up his uh, his sort of sense of foreboding. Um, and it's quite terrifying when you read the whole thing. Uh, and he's worried and the dogs worry him. Um, uh, and he asks him to settle down and have a drink. So what I would like you to do before you read chapter two is read that entire chapter. And um, I want you to see if you can actually write a paragraph in your own voice or in your own style that gives a sense of a place having a gothic feel. Try and create the sense of place in the way in which Bronte has done here. Um, describe an older mansion, an older house, even if you make one up in your head. Do not just describe a, a haunted place. I want you to try and look at the language of description here and see if you can manifest something similar. Thank you.